Good evening, tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that everyone is well and you've had a spiffing week wherever you are. Before we begin, I'd like to give my usual thanks to the fabulous Andrew McLean for all the art that he has produced for this series, and to all my Patreons for their continued financial pledge. It is much appreciated. A few links I'd like to mention. First of all, the Tales of the Hunger Games Discord which is based around this very series, along with the general Hunger Games Discord, where tales are created based on your choices. Another featured link this week is Natalie Parch, who has created various pictures based on victors. Feel free to find all three of those links, along with various other links in the description. And without further ado, let's go. Following the excitement and frenzy created by the first of this year's Hunger Games, Capital viewers spent the following weekend eagerly awaiting the reaping for District 12 that was due to take place at noon on the Monday, with many citizens arranging lunchtime reaping parties for the event. Mohammed Youssef and Shoned Thomas, District Victors of the 100th Hunger Games, arrived in District 12 during the morning, and it was clear that the pair were understandably unimpressed by the squalor and filth that lay throughout the settlement. Once they were in the reaping square and the last of the teal-clad youths were being ushered into their relevant places, Shoned was heard to ask Mayor Montelli where all the rest were, and both she and Mohammed were shocked to hear that the entire district population aged between 12 and 18 was in fact stood before them. As the final checks were made for the reaping to begin, several of the older youths were noted to do a three-finger salute, but they were swiftly removed from the enclosures by peacekeepers and escorted towards the prisoner hall that lay west of the Reaping Square. However, instead of showing this on Capital TV, the focus remained on the front of the enclosures, with Eugenia Ravenstill recounting how the Capital had been forced to bomb District 12 during the Second Rebellion, which had led to its smaller population. Rubius Dalton, victor of the 86th Hunger Games, also stated that due to the smaller population, many of those that were about to be selected as tributes may know each other, and this could play a vital role in these games. Within a minute, the reaping was ready to begin, and Shoned took a name from the female reaping bowl, which she revealed to belong to 12-year-old Zeneca Paisley. A cry was immediately heard from the front of the female enclosure, and the peacekeepers grabbed one of the smallest girls, who desperately kicked and screamed as she was dragged to the platform. Shoned and Mohammed were stunned by what was happening, but Mohammed was swiftly nudged by a peacekeeper, and so he picked a male name, which was revealed to belong to 16-year-old Time Wex. Yet it later emerged that Time was one of the youths that had just been removed from the enclosure, and as Mohammed appeared to be hearing this through an earpiece, he was quickly nudged once more by the peacekeeper to pick another name, which belonged to 18-year-old Nostrum Lip. The camera soon found a tall and slender young man, with a pale complexion and fair hair. As Nostrum appeared to realise what was happening, he looked around with exasperation, but his peers simply gave nods of support as the peacekeepers came to collect him. Whilst Nostrum walked down the aisle, Eugenia said that she liked his teal suit, but Rubius replied that he looked slightly brittle for victory. The next tribute selected by Shoned was 18-year-old Joy Gorlix. Once she was stood on the platform, Joy was seen to be almost as tall as Nostrum, with her long brown plait emphasising her height. Rubius said that this was surprising, given that District 12's average height was the smallest of all the districts. As Mohammed was about to choose another male name, Nostrum leaned forwards and gave Joy a sympathetic look that she reciprocated, and Eugenia stated that they must at least be friends. Plasmo, age 16, Blessing, age 17, and Rupert, age 17, were the next three tributes to be reaped, and they all came to the platform without causing much commentary from Rubius or Eugenia. The next chosen tribute was 14-year-old Delilah Undersea. As she was partly dragged into the aisle by peacekeepers, her lank black hair and thin frame came into view, and Rubius commented that the jewel embellishments on her dress probably weighed more than she did. Once Delilah was standing on the platform next to Blessing, Eugenia said that she looked like she was about to faint. Sacro, age 17, was subsequently reaped, and he and Rupert, age 17, briefly patted each other on the back as they stood on the platform together. Naomi, age 13, was the next to be chosen, and she appeared incapable of walking in a straight line as she approached the platform. Eugenia said that Naomi seemed inebriated, before asking how she had managed to access alcohol at such a young age, to which Rubius replied that this was certainly going to be an entertaining week. 
The next male tribute was 13-year-old Miles Cartwright. As his name was called, there was no movement within the enclosure, and after a few seconds, Mohammed reached for another name. However, just as he was about to take one out, a peacekeeper suddenly entered the relevant section of the enclosure and grabbed Miles, who foolishly seemed to think that by staying still, he could avoid being noticed. As he was pulled to the platform by his ginger curls, Miles let out a shriek of pain, and once he was stood next to Sacro, age 17, Rubius remarked that he was not so clever now. The next tribute to be reaped was 17-year-old Faith Hawthorne, and the camera soon found a snarling young lady with short brown curls and a pale teal dress, who was staring back at the camera with a vengeful expression. Yet as Faith was pulled out of the enclosure by a peacekeeper, she kicked him in the knee, which resulted in shocked gasps in Snow Square as another peacekeeper pointed his gun at Faith, whilst Rubius branded her a disrespectful little brute. She was then dragged to the platform and showed next to no emotion as she stood next to Naomi. After this commotion, Mohammed appeared to be ushered by his earpiece to choose the next male tribute as quickly as possible. He swiftly plunged his hand into the bowl and chose 16-year-old Restoro Diggs, who was subsequently shown on the screens to be breathing out in shock. As Restoro walked down the aisle, Eugenia said that he was the most normal-looking one so far, to which Rubius joked that this was not much of an achievement. The last four tributes to be reaped were Ivy, aged 15, who appeared to be clutching her left hand very carefully in her right, Beneficio, aged 15, who seemed generally uninterested in what was happening, Ada, aged 15, who immediately burst into tears, and Concocto, aged 17, who appeared to be the most well-built of all 16 tributes. Eugenia also noted that Ada was clearly trying to stand as far away from IV as she could once they were on the platform. When Concocto was in place, and most of the tributes were looking along the line at their competition, Mayor Montelli began to dismiss the crowds, but he was rudely interrupted by Faith, aged 17, who stepped forwards and performed a three-finger salute. The camera that was showing the tributes quickly focused on the enclosures once more, but due to the rebellious and stubborn nature of this district's citizens, some of their number joined in with this salute. The peacekeepers rushed to drag the tributes into the town hall, but before they had entered, Almost all citizens present were now performing this salute. The peacekeepers on the platform shot their guns, but mercifully did so over the heads of the crowds, which resulted in no fatalities. Screams rang out, however, from both the crowds in front of the town hall and the newly reaped tributes. Whilst these tributes were forced through the town hall and towards the cars on the other side of the building that would take them to the station, Chief Peacekeeper Cardew announced from the speakers on the platform that in penance for this rebellious act, the district's food allowance would be halved over the next week, whilst anyone caught outside of their home without permission would receive a televised flogging. This immediately caused outrage from District 12's population, and it is reported that despite these new rules, violence broke out throughout the district during that afternoon. Whilst the peacekeepers were desperately trying to control the unruly citizens within the reaping square, the 16 tributes were swiftly placed on the train, which began moving along the tracks before the tributes had even entered the main carriage. As the train made its way through the forest surrounding District 12, the AVOX presence stated that most of the tributes sat quietly in a state of shock and sorrow, whilst only Rupert and Sacro, both aged 17, along with Ivy and Beneficio, both aged 15, quietly whispered to each other. However, as the train travelled further beyond the district, some of the tributes began to get up and speak to each other. Miles, aged 13, had been sitting within a dark corner at the rear end of the carriage, and as District 12 disappeared over the horizon, a tear fell down his cheek. He approached a nearby bookcase, and in an apparent effort to hide his sadness, he placed a book about wolves in front of his face, which he pretended to read. Whilst most tributes were now at the front end of the carriage, Rupert and Sacro were walking together through the other end, and they saw Miles crying behind this book, which Rupert quickly snatched from his hands. Miles tearfully begged for them to give back the book, which made Sacro laugh, whilst Blessing, aged 17, looked with annoyance at him and Rupert. Sacro said that there was no point in reading, and that Miles should practice fighting with them. However, as he continued to cry and ask for the book, Rupert eventually threw it back, and Sacro sniggered. Meanwhile, Restoro, aged 16, tried to speak to Ivy, aged 15, at the dining table in the middle of the carriage. She was initially quite polite with Restoro, and they had a decent conversation about the area where they came from, that was known as the Seam. However, after a few minutes, Ivy nonchalantly removed her left hand, which was revealed to be a prosthetic, 
before flexing her arm and screwing it back on. Kung Kokto, age 17, had been sitting nearby and asked Ivy if he could look at her hand again, which caused the two to engage in a deeper conversation and Restoro soon moved away. Ada, aged 15, was sat on a nearby sofa and Restoro tried to speak to her, but within a minute she was heard to shout that she did not want to talk, which caused Restoro to scarper away towards the back of the carriage. He then sat down opposite Faith, aged 17, who was watching Miles begging Rupert and Sacro for the book. Restoro soon appeared to notice the black eye that Faith had been given by the peacekeeper's gun, following her salute at the reaping. Although she did not react to Restoro as he sat down opposite her, he said that she was brave. Faith gave him a confused look, but after a brief conversation, she began to grumble about why she thought that the game should have ended a long time ago, and other outlandish theories. However, whilst Restoro seemed interested by what Faith was saying, she soon asked why he was being so nice to her, to which he replied that she seemed to be handling this situation the best. Faith gave Restoro a perplexed smile, but he told her to look around, which she did, to see Naomi, aged 13, who in her drunken slumber was about to fall off a nearby sofa, whilst Ada, aged 15, was becoming more annoyed with Rupert and Sacro's teasing, and Concocto, aged 17, was trying to screw Ivy's hand back onto her wrist after she had accidentally broken it off. Restoro then asked if Faith now understood what he meant, and she cautiously grinned. Meanwhile, Nostrum and Joy, both aged 18, spent most of the journey's first half sat together on a sofa at the very front of the carriage. During this time, they watched and discussed the other tributes, including their potential strengths and weaknesses, whilst testing each other on the identification of various symptoms and their illnesses, but also occasionally joking about their shared past experiences, which produced some of the only laughter heard on this journey that appeared to annoy Plasmo, aged 16. As for Delilah, aged 14, she had been sat quietly at the front of the carriage when she heard the commotion involving Miles at the other end. Whilst Rupert was holding the book in his hand, Delilah appeared able to spot that it was about wolves, and once he and Sacro had moved on to tease Ada, she approached the bookcase, to find that it contained identical copies of this book at both ends of each of its eight shelves. Although this appeared to intrigue Delilah, she simply grabbed one of the copies and sat down to read it. She sat back down and read from this book for the next hour, whilst ignoring the other events in the carriage. Beneficio, aged 15, allegedly knew Delilah's older sister, Ruth, and he tried to speak to her, but she curtly ignored him and carried on reading, whilst only occasionally looking up whenever she heard a commotion from throughout the carriage. Almost an hour later, when the train had completed just over half of its journey, the Avoxes brought in the buffet, and the tribute swiftly approached the dining table, where the food was being laid out. As the two tallest tributes, Nostrum and Joy had forced their way to the front of the queue, and they quickly took their plates of food back to the sofa, where they tested each other on the symptoms of various conditions such as blood poisoning and hypoxia whilst they ate. Faith helped herself to a lot less food than Restoro, but they sat together in the corner and tried to identify what most of these types of foods were. However, shortly after Faith had finished eating, it was announced that tributes were allowed to retire to a private carriage before they arrived in the capital, if they so wished. While some of them looked around at each other, Faith immediately headed to her carriage, where it is believed that she slept for the rest of the afternoon and early evening. As for Miles, he was one of the last tributes to take food, which left him with less choice. Although he quickly ate what he had taken, he noticed that Ada had one of the last pork chops on her plate, which he managed to take when she was not looking. However, Plasmo had been talking to Ada at the time, and he noticed this, which caused a fight to break out between him and Miles, who was still trying to eat this meat whilst being pinned down against the floor in the corner of the carriage. Yet the Avox's presence swiftly acted and stopped this fight, before separating the boys. Delilah, who was later revealed to be the lightest tribute by over ten pounds, had spent this hour wolfing down several plates of food. As the fight occurred between Miles and Plasmo, she appeared intrigued by what was happening, but used this distraction to steal the last of the strawberries from the plate of Ada, who was trying to help Plasmo at the time. Delilah then headed back to her carriage with her plate of food, whilst Ada angrily asked who had taken these strawberries. Over the next few hours, only Nostrum, Joy, Restoro and Naomi stayed in the main carriage after eating. Restoro seemed to be pensively looking out the window, whilst Naomi continued to nap on a sofa, and Nostrum tested Joy on the toxins in various plants, with a strong focus on mushrooms. Restoro appeared to be listening to Nostrum and Joy, 
which they soon noticed, and although Restoro had seemed a little intimidated by the pair, they let him practice with them, which led to the trio discussing the other tributes and laughing at Ada's anger over the missing strawberries. As the darkness of night was setting in, the train arrived in Snow Station, and all tributes were swiftly escorted to limousines that drove them directly to the accommodation tower, where they were greeted in the main hallway by the mentor for District 12, Gail Hawthorne, who was coincidentally Faith's uncle. Most tributes did not appear to recognise Gail, and Rupert, age 17, asked if he was Rue Malark, victor of the 90th Hunger Games. However, Gail ignored this comment, and announced that he was the mentor for the district, and that due to his recent pulmonary surgery in Gaul Hospital, the capital had requested for him to not travel to District 12 for the reaping, which explained why he had not been with the tributes for their journey on the train. Gail then told them to choose a member of the opposite gender as their apartment cohabitant. Compared to the tributes from District 14, these tributes did this relatively easily, with many of these pairs seeming to have already been formed on the train. They were then taken to the apartments above, and were allowed to acclimatise themselves before Gail came to speak to each pair. Miles had found himself being placed with Zeneca, aged 12, and they were the first pair to whom Gail spoke. According to the AVOX present in this apartment, Gail tried to encourage the pair to think of strengths that they could use in the upcoming games, but even the mention of fighting appeared to scare both Miles and Zeneca. So after just a few minutes, Gail simply told them to focus during the next day's training before heading to the apartment above. It was here that he spoke to Nostrum and Joy, who were clearly much more promising in Gail's eyes. They told him how they had already been assessing the other tributes, and how they thought they could win if they worked together, to which Gail responded that whilst he was impressed by their strategic thinking, they should not be too arrogant. Faith seemed surprised when Restoro chose to partner with her, but she was clearly pleased to accept him instead of Rupert, who was her only alternative. It was only when Gail arrived in their apartment that Faith revealed to Restoro that he was her uncle. Restoro was apparently surprised, but she asked him not to tell any of the other tributes, and he assured them both that he would not say anything. Gail proceeded to discuss the upcoming training with the pair, but just as he was about to ask Restoro about his strategy for the games, the screen in the corner suddenly turned on. The trio jolted around to see someone being whipped, but it was only after a few seconds that Faith shrieked and shouted at nobody in particular to leave her father alone. Gail then realised that it was his brother, Vic, who was being whipped for having performed a three-finger salute during the reaping earlier that day. Both Faith and Gail were clearly in horror at what they were seeing, but as Faith threw a glass that narrowly missed the screen, Gail grabbed her and told her to not do anything stupid. The whipping continued for a few minutes, during which time Faith ran to her room and cried, but when it ended a few minutes later, Restoro and Gail both checked that she was feeling better. Whilst Faith still appeared upset, she was no longer crying or shaking, and Gail stated that he needed to move to the next apartment. The final apartment that he visited was that of Delilah and Beneficio, aged 15, the former of whom immediately asked when their dinner would be served, instead of anything about the upcoming training or games. Gail did try to focus their attention back onto these topics, but it ultimately appeared to be of no use, and after a brief explanation of what would happen within the arena, he left the apartment and was escorted back to Gaul Hospital. The next morning, all tributes were awoken at sunrise, before being taken down to the training centre, where training master Rubius Dalton was awaiting. During his explanation of the rules, Naomi fainted, but without stopping his sentence, Rubius simply walked over and kicked her repeatedly in the stomach until she was conscious, at which point she was ushered back onto her feet by another member of staff, and once Rubius had finished the explanation, the training began. Delilah headed straight to the longest assault course, which she proceeded to complete at faster speeds over the morning, whilst only taking an occasional rest when she needed. When Delilah thought that nobody was looking, she also headed over to the axe station, where she demonstrated reasonable skills, although when she noticed that Concocto, age 17, had been watching her, she swiftly headed back to the assault course, where she spent most of the remaining training time. As for Miles, he wandered aimlessly for a while before finding the camouflage station, where he spent the next few hours covering himself in a variety of paints in order to match the required backgrounds. There was an instance when Ivy, who was practicing the adjacent fabric station, unscrewed her hand and left it on a side table before looking up to see Miles' eyes appearing within a sandy background and looking back at her hand. 
She shouted at him to stay away, which resulted in Rubius quashing the situation, but apart from this, Miles did not interact with any other tributes. Meanwhile, Faith had immediately headed to the archery station, where she began to shoot a multitude of arrows with a high degree of accuracy. After Astoro had circulated the centre a few times and not decided where to practice, he asked Faith if he could watch her firing the arrows, to which he nonchalantly agreed. As the morning went on, Rubius appeared to be watching carefully as Faith gave Restoro advice, and within an hour, he was able to shoot an arrow in the general direction of a target. With two hours left, Restoro offered to show Faith some basic surgery, and after appearing to have tired herself in the archery station, she agreed. They headed over to the medical station that was particularly popular this week, where Restoro grabbed one of the dummies and laid it down on an available operating table. Faith appeared surprisingly disgusted by what followed, as Restoro showed her the extremely lifelike organs that lay inside, along with the easiest way to remove its spleen. Nostrum and Joy had initially worked in the sword station, where despite having never used swords before, they were able to fight each other and improve their defensive skills to some degree. However, Joy soon became distracted when she saw Ada being tasered in the adjacent aquatic station after she had attacked Rupert with a fishing rod, in retaliation to him and Sacro teasing her. As Blessing tried to help Ada, Joy said that it would be best for them to prepare for unforeseen wounds, to which Nostrum agreed, and they therefore headed to the medical centre, where Restoro was showing Faith his surgical skills. They also saw Concocto bashing his hands down on an electric dummy's chest, with enough strength to force a luminous stick from its throat, at which point the dummy sat up and smiled, before lying back down in position. Joy gingerly approached Restoro and asked if she and Nostrum could watch. As Restoro showed them and Faith where the gallbladder was located, Faith asked why they would want to watch, to which Nostrum replied that it could be useful, although she proceeded to give him a strange look after he looked back at the dummy. However, following this display, the group had a break, and they spoke about various topics. During this time, Joy was also heard to commend Faith for her bravery during the reaping the day before. The final hour passed relatively uneventfully, but just as Rubius was calling the tributes to leave their current stations, the large side stream turned on to Capital TV, where another flogging in District 12 was occurring. The tributes were practically all aghast as they watched, although Restoro suddenly ran forwards and shouted that this was his brother, Kuro. It later emerged that Restoro had had no idea that Kuro was removed from the enclosure at the beginning of the reaping for making a three-finger salute. Restoro angrily grabbed the nearest member of training staff and told him to turn off the screen, whilst the other tributes looked on in shock. As Restoro continued to shout and scream, he was swiftly tasered by Rubius. Faith then shouted a rather rude string of insults at Rubius, but she was also tasered by another member of staff, whilst the other tributes were swiftly escorted from the training centre. Over the afternoon, the tributes were prepared for their interviews in the dressing rooms of the Dalton Studios. It was noticed when Restoro and Faith arrived a little later that they each had bruises on their faces, although thanks to the expertise of the Avox styling team, these marks were hardly visible by the time the interviews were due to begin. Unlike the previous week, the stage was now lit by the traditional teal colours of District 12, and the tributes were all dressed in suits and dresses of teal and white colours. However, just like the previous week, the audience was eagerly awaiting to watch the tributes perform their chosen skills and answer questions from Eugenia Ravenstill, Rubia Stalton, and Artulia Fling. Zeneca, aged 12, was the first tribute to be interviewed, and it was said by some that she only scored a 3 instead of a 2 because she cried during the question and answer section. Nostrum followed Seneca, and for his chosen skill, various samples of bodily fluids were shown on the screen, which he identified according to the disease that would cause them. Although many of the audience seemed repulsed by these images, Nostrum performed very well, and only misdiagnosed one of the 43 samples. During the questions, Artulia asked if he would over-rely on his alliance with Joy, but he said that whilst they were stronger together, they were also strong alone, which triggered applause. Nostrum ultimately scored 5-6-6, six, six, according to Eugenia, Rubius and Artulia's judgement, which gave him a respectable overall score of 6. The next interview was that of Joy, and she rather bravely attempted the same skill as Nostrum, although unlike him, she managed 46 images during the allocated time, all of which she correctly identified. As the audience applauded, 
Rubius joked that Nostrum might drag Joy down in the games, but she replied that they had been friends since birth, and that this cemented their alliance. Eugenia asked if there was a romantic inclination towards their friendship, but this question appeared to confuse Joy, and she simply replied that there was not. The scores were then revealed as 5-6-7, which gave Joy a score of 6. Plasmo, Blessing and Rupert subsequently received middling scores, then they were followed by Delilah. After walking the runway, Eugenia stated that she appeared to have put on some weight since they saw her at the reaping, which caused controversial laughter from the audience, but Delilah swiftly replied that she would love to stay longer in the capital, simply for the food, which made the audience laugh and applaud once more. For Delilah's chosen skill, she avoided holograms of various weapons that flew out from the screen behind the judges. She successfully dodged every single one of the holograms, much to the crowd's amusement, and as she ended the display, a small box was brought onto the stage, which she folded herself into, amidst further applause. However, she did not manage as well with the questions, and when Rubius asked how she would fight a gang of armed tributes in an enclosed space, she became phased and lost her nerve. Delilah subsequently scored 4-3-4, which gave her an overall score of 4. After Sacro scored a respectable 5, and Naomi scored a not-so-respectable 2, it was Miles' turn. After letting out a nervous giggle whenever he needed to speak, it was immediately obvious that Miles was rather intimidated by the crowds and bright lights. For his chosen skill, he opted to camouflage his hand against a grey podium, which was shown on the screen, although he appeared to use an incorrect mixture of paint colours, which doomed this display from the start, and was ultimately called off by Rubius after just one minute. Furthermore, Miles' questioning did not go well, and he seemed to give up halfway through, which caused Artulia to be heard whispering to Eugenia that she hoped he would be an early out. Miles proceeded to score 2-2-2, two, 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 which gave him a very weak overall score of just 2. Faith was the next tribute to enter the stage. In what is now deemed one of the most infamous interviews since that of Selena Brax, victor of the 99th Hunger Games. Whilst walking down the runway, she ripped off a piece of her teal dress, before using it to wipe away the makeup that had been applied to her facial wounds when she was at the end of the runway. As Faith held this piece of the dress above her head, she rudely proclaimed that the capital could not hide the entire truth, before storming back to the stage amidst jeers from the audience. Faith then aggressively stated that this was her chosen skill, and as Rubius looked at Artulia in shock, Eugenia asked what Faith wanted to achieve from the games, yet she turned around to the portrait of President Gull and loudly exclaimed that she wanted to see him in the arena, before marching towards the portrait with the dirtied strip of her dress. However, the peacekeepers caught Faith before she could cause any vandalism, and Rubius said that they had seen enough to judge her, whilst the peacekeepers swiftly escorted her through the back of the stage. Faith was the only tribute this year to be unscored, and Ristoro was swiftly brought on. As he walked down the runway, Eugenia appeared entranced by his shiny black waves of hair, and once he was back at the stage, she asked if she could run her hands through his hair, which amused the audience and appeared to lighten the mood after Faith's interview. Ristoro then stated that he would like to perform surgery for his chosen skill, and to the surprise of many, the corpse of a recently deceased Avox was wheeled onto the stage, beneath a camera that displayed the body onto the right-hand screen. Ristoro was quickly helped into surgical robes by a pair of Avoxes, and once he was ready, Rubia stated that he had one minute to identify the cause of death, before beginning a timer. As the audience cheered in encouragement, Ristoro quickly cut open the body and viewed each organ. It could not be seen completely what he was doing, and some children in the audience even appeared quite distressed by this display, but after just 50 seconds, Ristoro identified from looking at the discoloration of the liver that the Avox had been poisoned with cyanide. After silent anticipation, Rubius announced that this was correct, which triggered wondrous applause from the audience. However, just like Delilah, Ristoro did not deal well with the questioning aspect of the interview, and he soon appeared phased and nervous, especially when the topic of alliances was mentioned. Due to this lacklustre second half of the interview, Ristoro scored 5-4-5, which still scored him 5 overall. The last four interviews went by without much of an issue, and it was announced at the end of the night that as Nostrum and Joy had each scored a 6, they had earned the highest scores of their respective genders. However, that night, during the pre-game's analysis, the capital opinion seemed very split, with several commentators stating that there were likely to be some dark horses within this group. 
Early the next morning, the tributes were each readied in their apartments by the team of AVOX stylists, whilst being held under the strict guard of peacekeepers. During this time, a public whipping was once again shown, and this time it was that of Joy's sister, Marie. She initially protested and screamed in horror, but Nostrum managed to hold her back from attacking the peacekeepers, and within an hour, all tributes were being taken from the roof of the accommodation tower by a blacked-out hovercraft. Once they were in the underground arena complex, the tributes were carefully led to their pre-designated rooms, where they were instructed to dress in black jackets, t-shirts and trousers, along with matching dark boots, that many of them seemed to think were rather heavy, including Zeneca, who debated with Gail about not wearing them, although he strongly advised against this idea. Gale visited all the other tributes over the next half hour, and it is believed that he offered them each advice about whether they should attempt to grab supplies from the cornucopia. After visiting the last room that belonged to Sacro, Gale appeared rather dazed, and he was ushered by peacekeepers towards the central viewing room. He then watched with the peacekeepers as the podiums rose into the cornucopia clearing. District 12's games took place in an arena known as the Woodland Hospital. This arena was circular in shape, with a radius of approximately 500 metres, which rendered it even smaller than that of the previous week. The central 200 metres of this arena was formed by a disused grassy clearing. In its centre was an exact replica of a formerly abandoned hospital within the capital that had since been demolished. Surrounding this clearing was a ring of thick woodlands, that measured approximately 300 metres in width, although as one reached the perimeter, the ground became much steeper, which helped to warn tributes of the impending perimeter. The trees of these forests were relatively sturdy, and there was no particular pattern to their layout, although occasional lakes and clearings appeared throughout. Furthermore, a pack of three wolves roamed through the forest, and they had been programmed to target tributes in a specific manner when the time came. Back within the central clearing, the hospital replica was made of three hollow buildings that were connected to each other by suspended walkways. The outer walls of the buildings were missing bricks and window frames, while some parts were even covered in thick vines. The three buildings each contained three floors and several rooms along each corridor, although most objects that would be found in a standard hospital were not present within this replica, and hence many rooms were completely empty. Various beds, Medicine cabinets and other equipment could be found throughout the hospital, although their state of repair was extremely varied. The podiums rose into the southern end of the hospital courtyard, thereby forming a semicircle that faced north towards the central building. A large pile of supplies lay in front of this building, which included many loaves and bags of fruit, a few sleeping bags and a surprisingly high number of water bottles. However, there were also six plinths that stood on the stairs at the front of the central building, beyond the other supplies. Each plinth was seen to hold a needle with various contents. As Eugenia and Rubius analysed the arena in the final moments before the podiums rose, Rubius stated that two of the needles were completely empty. Two contained a clear muscle relaxant, and two contained a misty white liquid that was a variant of a substance named tetrodotoxin, which he explained was highly toxic. As soon as the tribute's podiums entered the cornucopia clearing, the countdown began, and Rubius excitedly declared that he could not wait to see the chaos that would ensue. To Eugenia's surprise, most of the tributes did not appear overly perplexed by the presence of the three separate buildings in front of them, but many of them began to look towards the forest behind them as well. On the very left of the line was Delilah, whose jacket appeared to sag over her slender frame. She looked to her right to see that only Concocto was stood next to her, then after glancing down the line of podiums, she looked straight ahead towards the supplies. Nostrum and Joy quickly looked along the row of podiums for each other, and soon realised that they were both positioned on the left side of the line, with only Zeneca between them. They appeared pleased to see their proximity to each other, and as the countdown continued through 20 seconds, they began to eye the supplies, with Nostrum seeming to squint at the contents of the needles. As for Miles, he was positioned on a central podium between IV and Ada. He looked around eagerly and appeared to want to gain a reaction from either of these two girls, but they failed to give Miles what he wanted, and so he enthusiastically looked back towards the supplies that lay ahead. Restoro was placed further to the right, and after briefly looking at the supplies, 
he looked down the line to see Faith standing on the far right, between Rupert and Sacro. When ten seconds of the countdown remained, Restoro nodded to Faith in a reassuring manner, and for a few seconds she simply looked back at him and smiled. When there were just five seconds left until the gong was due to sound, Faith suddenly performed a three-finger salute, then winked at Restoro before raising her arms out to her side, and as Restoro shouted at her to stop, she let herself fall forwards. As jeers of disapproval raged through Snow Square, a loud explosion was heard within the arena, whilst earth and grass flew up from the ground in front of Faith's podium, and glass shattered from some of the eastern building's windows. Most tributes were clearly in shock at what had just happened, especially Rupert and Sacro, who were now covered in soil and apparently incapable of hearing. Yet whilst Restoro watched open-mouthed and some other tributes were desperately attempting to recompose themselves, the gong sounded. Although she had appeared to be eagerly eyeing the supplies, Delilah immediately jolted around and ran into the forest. Surprisingly, she and Plasmo were the only two tributes to run in this direction, but fortunately for Delilah, she headed southwest, whilst Plasmo headed in a more central southern direction, which allowed the pair to avoid each other. As for Astoro, he was clearly still in shock at Faith's death, and in the seconds that followed the gong, he remained rooted to his podium and watched as most of the other tributes ran forwards to the supplies. However, his attention was suddenly diverted when he noticed Miles grab a shard of glass that had been blasted from a window of the eastern building by the explosion. Restoro appeared to spot Joy fighting Naomi for a sleeping bag, but when he saw Miles running straight towards Joy, he finally left his podium and slowly ran forwards. As Miles suddenly pounced onto Joy's back and held the shard of glass to her throat, Restoro suddenly increased his speed. Meanwhile, Nostrum and Joy had each run in towards the pile of supplies when the gong sounded. Nostrum was one of the first to arrive at the needle steps, as they were dubbed by Rubius. Yet Rupert arrived at these steps a split second before Nostrum, and he grabbed a needle full of muscle relaxant. However, Nostrum quickly yanked Rupert back by the jacket, before running to the top of the steps to grab a needle containing the toxic tetrodotoxin that he held towards Sacro, who had appeared ready to approach these steps. Nostro suddenly saw Naomi trying to wrestle a sleeping bag from Joy, and he seemed to want to defend her. But after seeing Concocto quickly reach up over the western side of the stairs and grab the other needle of tetrodotoxin, Nostrum turned back to face him. Concocto had just reached up over the side of the steps to grab the other needle of tetrodotoxin, before jumping back down and looking to the western side of the clearing to see Ivy fighting Ada for a loaf of bread, at which point he charged towards the girls with the needle. When the gong sounded, Joy had immediately run in, and as she watched the chaos unfolding on the steps in front of her, she quickly checked the supplies that lay in front. She grabbed a sleeping bag, but a second later, Naomi attempted to pull on its other end. Joy yanked the sleeping bag harder, and used the length of her right arm to punch Naomi away. Yet just as she was about to check some of the other supplies, she was suddenly pounced upon by Miles. Whilst Miles tried to stab Joy's neck with a shard of glass, Nostrum watched her from the top of the steps, apparently realising that he could not give up this advantageous position. However, as Nostrum watched Naomi being knocked to the ground by Rupert, Miles was pulled off Joy's back and punched to the floor by Restoro, who quickly grabbed the shard of glass that Miles had just dropped. Over the next ten seconds, Sacro picked up Naomi from the ground and threw her against the steps towards Nostrum, whilst Concocto injected IV in the neck with the tetrodotoxin and Sacro and Rupert chased east after Ada with the needle full of muscle relaxant, during which time many of the other tributes were fleeing with whatever supplies they had managed to take. Restoro had tried to stab Miles in the neck with the shard of glass, but he had so far managed to avoid these swipes, and now appeared intent on attacking Restoro. In the later bloodbath analysis, Eugenia screamed at Miles to run whilst he could, but after noticing the potential danger that Restoro was in, Nostrum sprinted down the steps and tackled Miles, whilst Joy ripped off a rusty piece of the railing from the steps. As Nostrum then held Miles down against the ground, she proceeded to stab the railing through his head. Whilst the shouts and erratic movement of fleeing tributes echoed through the surrounding buildings, Restoro breathed out in exhaustion, and declared that they were the only three living tributes in this field. Joy also appeared shaken and exhausted as she and Nostrum checked her neck for cuts. Yet a few seconds later, a painful moaning sound was heard from the needle steps behind them. 
Nostrum jolted around with the tetrodotoxin needle still in his hand, to see Naomi sitting up and nursing her wounds after having been thrown onto these steps by Sacro. Eugenia shouted that Naomi should play dead, and as Restoro looked with bewilderment at her seemingly relaxed attitude, Nostrum apologised and marched towards her. Naomi only seemed to realise what was happening when Nostrum injected the needle into her neck, but before she could say anything else, he stepped back, and she fell back against the stone steps. Naomi coughed for the next ten seconds before shaking intensely, which caused her head to bash continuously against the stone floor beneath. Within thirty seconds, she was bleeding from her nose and completely still once more. Nostrum looked back down at the needle and eyed it very carefully, as Joy correctly identified it to contain a poison from puffing fish. Restoro then walked over to Ivy's body, and after seeing her bleeding nose, he correctly identified that she had also been killed with this substance, to which Nostrum replied that it must have been Concocto, who had taken the other needle containing the puffing fish poison. Four cannons then sounded, which Restoro counted on his fingers. Over the next few minutes, the sounds in the surrounding buildings began to quieten down, as many of the other tributes were finding places to hide within the hospital buildings or in the forests beyond. However, whilst Nostrum, Joy and Restoro began to place the few remaining supplies in their jackets, they heard a jeering sound and a scream from the top floor of the eastern building. The trio looked up to see Ada screaming once more and practically pushing herself against this window after Sacro and Rupert had found her. However, her screams were swiftly ended when Sacro injected her with the muscle relaxant. Over the next minute, the boys debated as to how they should kill Ada, who only seemed capable of an occasional blink during this time. Yet they eventually decided to throw her from the window, and shortly after she hit the stone path below, her cannon sounded. Joy and Restoro looked up to Rupert and Sacro, who were snarling back from this window at the top of the eastern building. As Restoro carefully dug out the inside of a loaf of bread and placed the two empty needles within, Joy suggested that they move to the western building, so that they were not so visible to Rupert and Sacro. Neither Restoro nor Nostrum appeared to have any aversions to this idea, and after checking that they had not left any supplies, they carefully entered the western building. Meanwhile, Delilah had continued to run southwest through the forest. As she heard the screams from the bloodbath, she seemed to increase her speed, but she was still able to avoid running into any of the tree branches, and so unlike Plasmo, who had also run into the forest, she did not fall over. However, after a few minutes, Delilah appeared to notice how steeply the ground was rising, and she soon took a break and rested against a tree. As the sound of the bloodbath died out, she looked ahead at the top of the hill, but seemed confused, and after squinting, she said out loud that this was the perimeter. A minute later, Delilah heard Plasmo hitting the perimeter, approximately 300 meters to her left, although fortunately for him, the perimeter's current was not as strong as in previous years, and so he was simply knocked back into a muddy bog with minimal injuries. However, this sound appeared to worry Delilah, and as four cannons sounded, she swiftly climbed a nearby tree, until she reached a relatively thick branch approximately five meters above the ground. Delilah proceeded to jump slightly as Ada's cannon sounded, but she managed to remain in the tree and simply watched the ground below. Over the next hour, she noticed the pack of wolves passing serenely beneath her tree, but even after spotting her, they did not appear interested in attacking. Meanwhile, in the central clearing, Nostrum, Joy and Restoro entered the western building. As they searched the empty rooms of the ground floor together, Nostrum held the tetrodotoxin needle, whilst Joy held the shard of glass, and Restoro held the other needle of muscle relaxant. Eugenia stated that they appeared confident, possibly due to their greater numbers compared to most other tributes, who were fighting alone, and after ten minutes, Nostrum declared that this floor was empty. The trio then proceeded to the middle floor, which they checked very carefully together, but apart from a few old medicine cabinets, they failed to find anything or anyone. After checking the last room, Joy quietly signaled for them to head to the room above, and they entered the stairway, but just as they were about to enter the upper floor, they heard a banging from one of the rooms on the floor that they were leaving. It had been shown to viewers that Blessing, who had immediately run to this building during the bloodbath, had very carefully hidden herself within the vents above this room, but after narrowly avoiding being noticed by the trio when they were in this room, she had decided to flee, now that they had gone. Nostrum immediately ran back down the stairway, and he was followed by Restoro and Joy. 
but as they entered the corridor, a door slammed on the ground floor, and seconds later, they saw Blessing running east through the cornucopia clearing. Nostrum seemed tempted to chase her, but Restoro responded that if they went outside, they would give away their position, and so they should let her go for now. Joy seemed to agree, and after some persuasion, Nostrum joined her and Restoro in heading back up the stairway to the upper floor. The trio started searching the southernmost rooms on this floor, but found nothing except for some dilapidated operating tables and malfunctioning x-ray machines. They spent the next five minutes carefully checking the vents above each room for any hiding tributes, but with no results. It appeared that this floor was empty, but just as they were checking the antepenultimate room on the corridor's left side, a loud thud suddenly sounded against the floor in the room at the northern end of this corridor. Nostrum quickly helped Joy back down from this vent, whilst Restoro ran down the corridor and into this room, to see Beneficio standing by the open window. Viewers had seen that Beneficio could hear the trio checking the vents of each room on this corridor, and so as he had been hiding in the vents at the end of this corridor, he tried to quietly descend from the ceiling. Yet unfortunately for him, he had slipped, and hence created a lot of noise when he fell to the floor. Restoro ran towards Beneficio with the needle of muscle relaxant. However, he had already opened the window and quickly scurried out, before falling back and gripping onto some attached ivy. Restoro then thrust the needle out of the window towards Beneficio, and after it narrowly avoided puncturing his neck, he let go of the ivy in a panic and fell onto the walkway below that connected the western and central buildings. Nostrum and Joy immediately rushed into this room and asked who was there, but as Restoro watched Beneficio try to stand up on top of this walkway, its roof suddenly gave way and he fell inside, at which point Restoro and Joy quickly ran back downstairs. However, Nostrum then spotted Rupert and Sacro running into the forest from the eastern building, so he stood still and watched from the window. Joy was the first to reach the walkway, with Restoro just behind her. They saw Beneficio trying to hobble towards the central building, but due to the way he had landed on his left foot, this was extremely painful, and he fell over once again as Joy appeared. She ran forwards with the shard of glass and hesitantly crouched down to kill Beneficio, but at the last moment, he smacked her across the face, which knocked her to the ground as well. Viewers in Snow Square cheered for either Joy, who was desperately trying to hold on to the glass, or Beneficio, who was trying to stab it into her neck. Joy screamed at Restoro to help her, but he seemed quite dazed and clearly worried about how he would attack Beneficio without being stabbed himself. Yet just as Beneficio was about to stab Joy in the neck, Nostrum suddenly sprinted past Restoro and towards Beneficio, who he swiftly stabbed in the neck with the tetrodotoxin. As Beneficio's breathing became strained and Joy proceeded to breathe out in relief, she shouted at Restoro, angrily asking why he had not helped, to which he nervously replied that he would do better next time. Nostrum responded that he and Joy could easily kill Restoro, and so he needed to pull his weight, to which Restoro simply nodded and apologised once more, whilst Beneficio convulsed on the ground next to Joy, who was starting to get up. A cannon sounded, and Nostrum began to lead the way towards the central building, but just as Joy was about to join him, Restoro asked if it would be best to have a rest before they continued. Nostrum at first seemed to be against this idea, but Joy stated to Nostrum that she needed some water, and so he agreed. The trio then headed back into the western building, and as the camera showed Restoro walking ahead, Eugenia joked that one could see both relief and worry on his face. When Beneficio's cannon sounded, Delilah remained in the tree of the southwestern sector, where she had been hiding. Due to her lack of movement and activity, the camera did not focus a lot on her over the next hour, but it is believed that she simply rested in the tree. However, after one hour had passed, Delilah suddenly became alerted to the sound of Sacro and Rupert's voices, as they walked parallel to the perimeter in her direction. Fortunately for Delilah, she was a few meters closer to the perimeter than Rupert and Sacro, and so they narrowly avoided passing underneath her tree. But she was able to see them through the adjacent trees as they passed. Almost a minute went by, and Delilah appeared less able to hear them, but just as Rubius was about to comment on who Rupert and Sacro would most likely encounter next, Eugenia gasped when she noticed that Delilah was in fact climbing down from the tree. She then proceeded to follow the boy's footsteps between the trees. A few minutes later, Sacro slipped on the side of a lake, and did not appear to notice that this had caused him to drop his water bottle, but Delilah picked it up when she found it, which enabled her to finally drink some water. After almost half an hour, 
Sekiro and Rupert decided to rest in the clearing in the middle of the western sector, and Delilah managed to keep a distance as she heard them discussing how long they should rest for. The trees in this sector contained less branches, and were therefore more difficult to climb, yet Delilah hid behind a large bush that lay approximately 30 metres from this clearing, which allowed her to see the boy's legs and listen to their conversation. She appeared slightly amused to hear Sacro guessing that she was already dead, but she remained silent as she watched them. In fact, over the next two hours, most tributes, including Nostrum, Joy, and Restoro, remain in the same place, and simply help themselves to whatever supplies they had. Two hours later, Horn of Plenty played for the first time, and the portraits of Naomi, aged 13, Miles, aged 13, IV, aged 15, Beneficio, aged 15, and Ada, aged 15, were all shown in the sky. Some viewers in Snow Square pointed out that Faith's portrait had not been shown, but Rubius swiftly suggested that this was likely due to the disrespect that she had shown to the capital in her manner of death. A few relatively peaceful minutes went by throughout the arena, during which time Rubius asked if this measly group were planning to provide any entertainment to the capital any time soon. Eugenia joked that Rubius had also done his fair share of hiding whilst in the arena, but before he could even reply, a set of loud howls were heard from the southern sector of the forest. Eugenia quickly refocused the camera onto the pack of wolves, and viewers in Snow Square marvelled as their mouths foamed between their howls. Rubius then read from the screen in front of him that the pack had just been triggered with a rapid onset rabies infection that could be passed through a variety of bodily fluids. As cheers subsequently erupted in Snow Square, the pack of wolves suddenly darted northwest into the southwestern sector, where Blessing was positioned at the time. She was shown to have noticed the howls, but remained hidden in a bush. Yet as the wolves neared her, she suddenly got up and sprinted north, towards the western sector, where Delilah, Sacro, and Rupert were all positioned at the time. Blessing continued running as quickly as she could, but the wolves soon appeared behind her, and as she panicked, she tripped onto the ground and screamed. Blessing was then bitten by the pack with such intensity that her cannon sounded after just 30 seconds. This alerted Delilah, who appeared to panic, and she quickly grabbed her water, before running east, back towards the central clearing. However, Rupert and Sacro also seemed to have been alerted by Blessing's screams and the cannon. They then heard Delilah running, and as she appeared through the tree line, they ran after her. Rupert shouted with excitement as they chased Delilah, who tried to shout back that the wolves were rabid. Yet within ten seconds, the boys had almost caught up with her, and the wolf pack were now just a hundred metres to her south. As Rupert closed in on Delilah, she shouted that they all needed to run, but while Sacro looked up and finally spotted the approaching wolves, Rupert tackled her to the ground and held the muscle relaxant needle at the ready. Sacro shouted that Delilah was right and that they needed to run, but just as Rupert was about to inject her with the needle, one of the wolves suddenly jumped through the air and knocked him to the ground. Sacro shouted at the wolf to leave Rupert alone, whilst Delilah unscrewed the lid of her water bottle and another of the wolves ran towards her. As Rupert screamed in pain, Delilah quickly threw some of her water towards the wolf's face when it was about to pounce on her. It suddenly yelped and stopped running, whilst erratically swaying its head about in apparent agony. Delilah jumped to her feet, but at that moment, the other of the three wolves ran towards Sacro and knocked him to the ground. Whilst Rupert's screams appeared to sound more and more painful, Delilah began to run east through the forest. She ran past Sacro and noticed that he was using all his strength to push away the wolf that was attacking him. For a split second, Delilah appeared to be in two minds, but when the wolf bit Sacro's hand, she threw some water at its face, which made it cower back and jostle its head around like the other wolf, who still appeared to be suffering. Without saying another word, Delilah continued east through the forest, and despite clearly feeling pain in his hand, Sacro ran after her. Almost a minute later, they re-entered the clearing, and as they headed towards the hospital, Rupert's cannon sounded. Delilah glanced over to Sacro, who was running next to her, and she appeared perplexed that whilst he shed a tear, he appeared to be producing a large amount of saliva from his mouth. However, the pair ran onwards, and as Sacro was about to head towards the western building, Delilah continued to run towards the eastern building. Sacro then followed her, and as the annoyance on Delilah's face became clear, Eugenia stated that she had caught on, and was now trying to avoid Sacro before he turned. Meanwhile, Nostrum, Joy, and Restoro had remained in a room of the western building that lay next to the walkway 
after Nostrum had suggested that it would be best to let the others come to them. As Blessing's cannon sounded, they all appeared perplexed by who it belonged to, but as Rupert's cannon sounded as well, Nostrum looked out the window to the south. Restoro and Joy soon joined him, and after spotting Delilah and Sacro running east across the clearing, Nostrum suggested that they head into the central building, to which Restoro and Joy agreed. The trio carefully headed through the walkway and into the central building, once again armed with their respective weapons. They slowly made their way up the stairway towards the upper floor, but as they were about to turn the corner on the final part of the stairs, Restoro suddenly put his hand up to Joy and Nostrum to stop, when he seemed to have thought that he heard someone moving on the ground floor. After a few seconds, Restoro appeared to realise that he was mistaken, but as the trio carried on upwards, a medicine cabinet suddenly crashed down the top of the stairway towards Nostrum. The cabinet then bounced off one of the stairs and hit Nostrum in the chest, which saw him fall against a side wall. Meanwhile, Joy and Restoro quickly looked up the stairs to see that Seneca was running out of their sight, back into the corridor to the right. As Nostrum clutched his chest, Joy and Restoro sprinted up the stairs and ran after Zeneca with their shard of glass and needle of muscle relaxant. Joy ran faster than Restoro, but after a minute, he managed to find Zeneca beneath a pile of surgical robes. She desperately tried to kick his groin and free herself from his grip, but he held her against the wall and injected her with a muscle relaxant, which caused her to drowsily flop forwards into his arms within seconds. Upon hearing this commotion, Joy entered the room and congratulated Restoro for finding Zeneca, to which he quietly nodded. Within a minute, they were joined by Nostrum, who limped in and shouted furiously at Zeneca. Upon a replay, Eugenia noticed how surprised Joy seemed by Nostrum's anger, and Rubius jokingly replied that he had not seemed like the angry type. As Seneca helplessly blinked, Nostrum told her in a surprisingly high level of detail about how much he hoped the tetrodotoxin would hurt her, and even Joy interrupted by telling him to get on with it, whilst Restoro looked on aghast. Nostrum eventually listened to Joy and injected Zeneca, but just seconds later, a cannon sounded. Nostrum, Restoro and Joy each darted their eyes to Zeneca, who was still breathing, and Restoro guessed that this cannon belonged to either Sacro or Delilah, who had run into the eastern building. Zeneca's body began shaking, and when her cannon sounded, just 30 seconds later, the trio left the room, and rested in an empty room on the ground floor of this central building, which gave them a fine view of the clearing. During this time, Delilah had proceeded into the eastern building, and even though she was clearly trying to avoid Sacro, he continued running with her. She then stopped in an empty room on the middle floor, and was clearly worried to see Sacro standing in the doorway and panting. Delilah appeared very unsure of how to act, but she said to Sacro that she would continue to look out the window for other tributes. He then walked into the room, and simply sat on the floor, before looking up at the ceiling, then scratching and panting once more. Delilah seemed relieved to spot a shard of glass on the floor in front of her, which had been shattered from the window during the explosion that was caused by Faith. While Sacro was distracted, she carefully reached down to grab it, but he then turned around and vomited onto the floor around him. Delilah jolted around, and with the shard of glass behind her back, she appeared to notice Sacro's bloodshot eyes, before asking him what was wrong. However, he swiftly ran out of this room and into another, that was seen on the cameras to contain several unkept hospital beds that were divided by rows of tattered curtains. Delilah listened from the room in which she had been, while Sacro began to yelp in pain and spit copious amounts of saliva on the floor. She looked carefully from the window, but after a minute, she appeared to notice that Sacro had stopped making any noise. Delilah then gripped the shard of glass even tighter as she slowly walked into the corridor and looked into the room where Sacro had gone. She called his name, and after hearing nothing in response, she appeared tempted to walk back the way she had come. However, after a few seconds, she slowly walked into the room and passed the curtains that separated the first few beds. Delilah called his name once more and looked around as a scratching sound could be heard against the floor. She then said that she would be leaving this building soon, but a second later, the curtain to her right was suddenly ripped off by Sacro as he jumped off the bed and onto Delilah. She screamed as he held her down and gnashed his teeth, whilst drool fell from his mouth and landed on her neck. Many viewers were now cheering in Snow Square, and whilst Eugenia had jumped in shock, Delilah was keeping her mouth firmly shut, whilst using all her strength to keep Sacro from biting her, with Rubius stating that he had become a foul, rabied beast. Although Sacro's teeth reached just three centimetres from Delilah's neck, 
she used his proximity to headbutt him, which made him fall off to the side and yelp. In an almost lupine manner, she then grabbed the shard of glass, and as Sacro jumped towards her again, she stabbed him in the heart. Delilah breathed out in shock and scurried backwards as Sacro slowly fell forwards. She squealed in disgust and snatched a nearby curtain that she used to wipe the saliva from her neck. As his cannon sounded, she started to walk towards the stairway, but after a moment, she suddenly stopped and appeared to think before walking back to Sacro's body. Delilah then took the water bottle from her pocket and grabbed an old pair of surgical gloves that lay on one of the beds. In a rather confusing display, she then ran her gloved finger along Sacro's gums that were seen to be covered in his saliva. Although many viewers in Snow Square appeared confused by what Delilah was doing, it became clear when she proceeded to run this saliva around the rim of the bottle, and Eugenia said that Delilah would need to remember to not drink from this bottle. Delilah ran up the stairway to the top floor, and as Zeneca's cannon sounded, she headed into an old patient bedroom on the side of the building that overlooked this clearing. It only contained a dirty old bed and creaking wardrobe, along with an adjoining bathroom that clearly needed repairs. However, she stayed here for the next two hours, whilst Nostrum, Joy and Restoro ate some of their supplies in the central building. Plasmo was now camouflaged against a wall on the ground floor of the western building, although Eugenia said that he appeared thirsty and would likely need to move soon. However, as it became dark, Concocto stumbled into the clearing from the southern forest. Although he had fought off two of the wolves earlier by impaling their chests with a tree branch, he had not managed to kill the third until it had bitten him on the back. As he was walking through the southern forest, Concocto was foaming at the mouth and shouting for his girlfriend, Elixia, who he appeared to believe was standing in front of him. Over the next hour, Concocto remained in the clearing and aggressively punched the podiums and walls of the buildings. Although other tributes could see him, they did not appear willing to enter the clearing or attack him, and so they simply watched him from where they were. Once it was fully dark, Horn of Plenty played again, and the portraits of Zeneca, aged 12, Blessing, aged 17, Rupert, aged 17, and Sacro, aged 17, were all shown, which left only six tributes remaining. Nostrum, aged 18, Joy, aged 18, Plasmo, aged 16, Delilah, aged 14, Restoro, aged 16, and Concocto, aged 17. For the next hour, most tributes remained where they were, and either hid or rested. Nostrum, Joy, and Restoro rested in a room on the ground floor of the central building, from which they could see Concocto continually scratching his own face and yelling within the clearing. Eugenia also noted that Joy seemed slightly relaxed compared to Nostrum and Restoro, who were still watching from the window, possibly due to her only having one gender opponent remaining. Shortly after the hour had passed, Joy asked if Nostrum and Restoro would watch her whilst she had a nap, and although Restoro did not openly object, Nostrum reminded her that she could sleep once they had caught Delilah, before suggesting that they hunt for her now that it was dark. Restoro seemed surprised when, after some thought, Joy agreed to this plan, and within five minutes, the group had hidden almost all their supplies in a medical cupboard, except for a water bottle that Restoro carried. For the next 30 minutes, they slowly made their way through the rest of the central building, before heading into the eastern building. During this time, Nostrum was continually giving orders about who should enter which room, although this was clearly irritating Restoro, and Joy even whispered to Nostrum to stop giving orders. After 15 minutes, they were already checking the rooms along the middle floor, and it was at this time that Delilah appeared to hear them from the patient bedroom in which she was hiding on the floor above. As they proceeded up the stairs to the top floor, Delilah was seen to panic, but with no available escape, she swiftly hid herself in the shower of the adjoining bathroom and closed her eyes, whilst breathing deeply. The trio then entered each of the bedrooms along this floor, while seeming to take turns to enter and check each bathroom. After just over a minute, Delilah held her hand over her mouth as they entered the room in which she was hiding. Nostrum ordered Restoro to check the bathroom, whilst he and Joy looked under the bed. Although Restoro was seen to roll his eyes, he walked into the bathroom, whilst Joy checked the wardrobe, and Nostrum walked back into the corridor. Restoro nonchalantly held his needle of muscle relaxant as he checked behind the door, but when he pulled back the shower curtain to see Delilah, he suddenly froze. As Joy walked back into the corridor, Restoro looked up into Delilah's eyes, while she held her finger firmly over her lips. 
Nostrum then told Restoro to hurry, but before he could respond, Delilah pulled the water bottle from her pocket, then pulled down her lip to point at her gums, then to the rim of the bottle, before thrusting it towards Restoro. He told Nostrum that he was about to come out of the bathroom, then Delilah pointed at the bottle in his pocket, whilst gesturing that they switched them. Restoro quickly pointed out the window to Concocto, and then back at Delilah's bottle of water, to which he nodded and pointed towards the corridor. Then just as Nostrum was about to re-enter the bathroom, Restoro exchanged the bottles with Delilah and closed the shower curtain. He exited the bathroom, and Nostrum asked why he had taken so long, but as they walked out of the bedroom, Restoro simply replied that he had used the toilet. The group then checked the rest of the upper floor to find no other tributes, and so Nostrum suggested that they head back to their earlier resting place. Restoro and Joy agreed, but it was noticed that whilst they walked back along the walkway, Restoro was carefully eyeing the bottle of water that Delilah had just given him. They soon returned to the ground floor of the central building, and Joy and Nostrum ate some fruit whilst Restoro very carefully opened the bottle. Whilst the former pair were distracted by their own conversation, they did not appear to notice that Restoro was carefully eyeing the outer rim of the bottle, which he appeared to realise contained traces of white saliva. Eugenia then asked if the rabies infection could be spread through saliva, and Rubius replied that it had been engineered to survive in water, which therefore meant that it could indeed be transferred this way. Restoro very diligently held the water bottle upwards, in order to mimic having drunk from it, before letting out a loud gasp as he brought it back down, and stating that he had been thirsty. Nostrum asked if he could have some water, and Restoro did not hesitate to pass the bottle to him. Restoro watched as Nostrum's lips touched the outside of the bottle's rim, and as he finished drinking, he asked Joy if she would also like some water, at which point Restoro was clearly trying to contain his excitement, whilst many of Nostrum and Joy's supporters in Snow Square shouted obscenities at Restoro. Joy at first declined, but after a few seconds, changed her mind and drank from the bottle. As she reapplied the lid of the bottle, Joy said that the water had tasted slightly strange, and although Restoro briefly looked panicked, he responded that he had thought the same thing, to which Joy shrugged and nodded, before eating some more fruit. For the next half hour, the trio continued to watch Concocto, who was now slobbering over the ground and spitting blood, which was even causing some disgust within Snow Square. Restoro appeared slightly apprehensive during this time, due to Joy and Nostrum appearing unaffected. But when Joy stated that she was feeling nauseous, and Nostrum began itching the skin on his back with greater intensity, Restoro seemed slightly relieved. However, a few minutes later, a loud crashing was heard from the western side of the floor above. The trio immediately grabbed their weapons and looked towards the origin of the sound, which was shown to viewers to be caused by Plasmo, who had been trying to break the floor of the eastern walkway by dropping an x-ray machine against it. Yet as Nostrum asked who this was, Joy suddenly vomited into the corner, and he watched in disgust, before scratching the sides of his neck. Snow Square then became tense with silence, as it appeared obvious that viewers were about to see some action. However, Restoro quickly grabbed the muscle relaxant needle, and said that he would deal with this situation. Nostrum nodded, and he rubbed Joy's back whilst Restoro grinned, as he headed west along the corridor, before slowly walking up the stairway with his needle at the ready. After almost two minutes, Restoro finally reached the top of the stairway and carefully walked towards the broken x-ray machine that shimmered in the moonlight upon the walkway. He was about to reach down to touch it when Plasmo suddenly ran up behind him. It was seen that Plasmo had been hiding in the nearest room, where he had found a case full of surgical implements, one of which was a scalpel, that he held out as he charged towards Restoro. Plasmo lunged forwards through the darkness and pierced Restoro's shoulder, which made him yelp and scurry back from Plasmo. Both boys appeared to have trouble seeing through the darkness, but as Plasmo knelt down and tried to stab Restoro, he was stabbed in the leg by Restoro's needle. Plasmo winced and brought his scalpel down again, but it narrowly missed Restoro's hand, and seconds later he was unable to move his legs. Plasmo proceeded to shout for mercy, but as his body stopped moving, he simply whimpered. Restoro then took the scalpel and stabbed it through Plasmo's neck, before running into the eastern building as its cannon sounded. During this time, Joy had just about managed to stop vomiting, but her eyes were now clearly bloodshot and Nostrum was still scratching. Joy gasped when she looked up to see his scratched neck, and she asked what had happened. Nostrum seemed worried and perplexed by this question, but he replied to Joy that her eyes were all red. The pair glanced at the clearing outside as a painful moan was heard from Concocto, then as they looked back to each other, 
Nostrum furiously stated that they had been infected, at which point Plasmo's cannon sounded. Joy cried and spluttered before asking how, but as Nostrum looked around in a frenzy, he suddenly saw the water bottle and roared Restoro's name. Joy angrily breathed out in disbelief as Nostrum explained that he never actually saw Restoro drinking from the bottle, and as Joy appeared to realise what had happened, she grabbed her shard of glass and said that she would kill him herself. Whilst Nostrum and Joy started to hunt through the central building for any form of medicine that could cure their medication, or for Restoro himself, he arrived on the upper floor of the eastern building. Fortunately for Restoro, Delilah had remained in the same room as earlier, and she heard him whisper her name as he approached. She quickly ushered him into the room and barricaded the door with a bed, whilst he relayed to her what had happened, and the pair quickly agreed to an alliance. Delilah and Restoro spent the next half hour looking at the moonlit clearing, where Concocto was now ripping away parts of his own skin and bleeding profusely. They were occasionally able to hear Nostrum and Joy angrily heading through the central building and searching for them, but due to Joy's rapidly debilitating state, she was unable to walk very far without resting, and she soon asked Nostrum for them to stay in a room on the middle floor. However, shortly after they had entered this room, the remaining wolf ran into the clearing. Concocto gnashed his teeth when he saw it approaching, but as he erratically nodded his head back and forth, the wolf attacked him, and after a brief yet gruesome scene, Concocto's cannon sounded. The wolf then appeared to look for a new target, before running straight back into the eastern sector of the forest. At midnight, Joy was once again conscious, but Nostrum was now shouting at the air in front of him to not leave, which appeared to worry Joy. As for Restoro and Delilah, they waited in the same room, and Restoro answered Delilah's questions about Nostrum and Joy, regarding how they had fought so far against the other tributes. Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of Plasmo, aged 16, and Concocto, aged 17, were shown, which left only Nostrum, aged 18, Joy, aged 18, Delilah, aged 14, and Restoro, aged 16, remaining. Yet within seconds of the anthem ending, both pairs of tributes heard a hissing sound within their corridors. Despite Delilah's initial objections, Restoro carefully opened the door to see a thick yellow gas flowing from each end of the corridor. He then grabbed her by the hand and said that they needed to run, and after quickly grabbing their respective scalpel and shard of glass, they covered their mouths with their jackets and headed towards the central stairway between the two approaching clouds of gas. Meanwhile, Joy had also noticed the gas, and she quickly pulled Nostrum into the corridor, whilst he shouted at his mother to stop grabbing him. However, Joy managed to pull him towards the front door, and as they looked out through the moonlit night, they suddenly heard Restoro and Delilah running down the central stairway of the eastern building. Joy grabbed Nostrum again, and tried to pull him towards the steps at the front of this building, where Restoro and Delilah would be likely to escape from the gas that was now flowing down the stairway towards them. Nostrum snarled a little at first, but when Joy snapped her fingers and reminded him of who she was, he appeared to come out of this trance and run with her. Just as Restoro and Delilah were descending the final section of the stairway, Joy held Nostrum against the wall to the side of these steps. She then spluttered, but found a relatively long piece of a broken railing that she grabbed and held tightly before gripping Nostrum's hand and telling him that he was going to be okay. Restoro was running down the left side of the steps, next to where Joy was hiding, but as he maintained his grip on Delilah's hand, Joy suddenly swung the piece of railing into his leg, which caused him to fall down these steps and pull Delilah with him. As the crowds cheered with excitement in Snow Square, Nostrum suddenly appeared to remember what Restoro had done, and before he could get to his feet, Nostrum gnashed his teeth and charged towards Restoro before knocking him to the ground. Meanwhile, Joy had also run towards Delilah and smacked the broken railing down onto the side of her head. Delilah shouted in pain, but used all her strength to grab onto the railing and stop Joy from smacking it down against her once more. However, as Joy watched Nostrum gnashing his teeth at Restoro, she suddenly lunged down and bit Delilah's neck. Shocked gasps were heard in Snow Square as Delilah screamed in pain, but the hovercraft that had been lingering just beneath the dome of the arena suddenly descended, and flew down towards this scene, hovering at a lower altitude than the height of the building, which illuminated the ground below. Although Nostrum was still attacking Restoro, it was clear during a replay that he was now distracted by these bright lights above. As Delilah desperately tried to hold on to the bite on her neck, whilst pushing Joy's railing away, Restoro was finally able to pull the scalpel from his pocket. Nostrum then returned his attention to Restoro and very nearly bit his neck 
but Ristoro quickly stabbed the scalpel through Nostrum's heart, and a few seconds later, he fell forwards onto Ristoro, who used all his strength to push Nostrum's body from above him. Joy still appeared too distracted by trying to push the railing against Delilah and the hovercraft above, to notice that Nostrum was now bleeding to death, but a few seconds later when Nostrum's cannon sounded, she suddenly jolted around and gasped in horror after seeing his body. Eugenia quickly announced that Ristoro Diggs was the male victor of District 12's games, whilst Joy roared and charged towards him, with saliva drooling from her mouth. Yet just as Eugenia was about to announce that any physical harm towards Ristoro would result in a detonated tracker, Joy tackled him to the ground. Delilah gasped in shock and held her neck as Joy punched Ristoro's face, but this instantly resulted in Joy's arm exploding and a shower of blood hitting Ristoro and Delilah. Ristoro coughed out and spluttered in disgust as Joy lay convulsing on the ground. Delilah looked up at the hovercraft once more and told Ristoro to put her out of her misery. He nodded and ready to scalpel, then as the hovercraft moved even closer to the ground, he stabbed Joy in the heart, and within seconds she stopped moving. As Ristoro walked back through the flurry of air that was now emanating from the hovercraft, Delilah reached him and asked if Joy was dead. Yet a second later, her cannon sounded, and two ladders quickly fell from the hovercraft above. As Delilah and Ristoro grabbed onto these ladders that swiftly rose into the hovercraft, Eugenia announced that Delilah Undersea was the female victor of District 12's games. A plethora of cheers and a few jeers emanated through Snow Square as Ristoro and Delilah were flown out of the arena. Whilst the hovercraft flew to Gaul Hospital, Delilah and Ristoro were immediately injected with the antidote for the rabies infection, and throughout Eugenia and Rubius's immediate review of the games, they regularly checked in on these new district victors and interviewed their doctors. By sunrise, it had fortunately become clear that thanks to the capital's medical expertise, both Ristoro and Delilah had responded well to treatment, and neither of them were showing signs of the infection. Furthermore, their other wounds were already healing nicely, and they were declared to have received no sustained injuries during these games. On the Friday evening, their victor interview took place in the Dalton Studios, for which they wore matching teal clothes. Eugenia jokingly pretended to be worried about shaking the pair's hands due to the rabies infection, which caused laughter from the audience. However, Delilah and Ristoro both appeared happy to go along with this joke, and the interview began smoothly. Eugenia asked them about their respective strategies and how they appeared to fight in a more similar manner than was expected, to which they both agreed. Ristoro also admitted that after poisoning Nostrum and Joy with a water bottle, he had been so scared that he almost wet himself, which caused raucous laughter. After she was pressed for her favourite moment in the arena, Delilah eventually admitted that it was seeing Rupert being bitten by a wolf when he had tried to kill her. When it was time for the death analysis, the first to be shown was that of IV, and Ristoro tactlessly asked why they were not focusing on Faith's death, which caused an uncomfortable silence from the audience. However, Eugenia managed to move this conversation along by quickly asking the pair what had been going through their minds in the moments before the gong sounded, and this eventually appeared to move the interview back to its intended topics. Eugenia also stated that the capital's nicknames for both Ristoro and Delilah had changed throughout the day, but that the most popular were The Menace and Lady Lupin, from their respective methods of victory. Although Ristoro appeared mildly amused by his nickname, Delilah did not understand hers, but Eugenia revealed that the word Lupin meant wolf-like, for the way she had infected other tributes with the wolves' rabies, and Delilah appeared to approve. After the reaping for District 11 that occurred the next Monday, Ristoro and Delilah were allowed to return to District 12, where they were each gifted with a house in the victor's village by the capital. They then moved into these houses with their families, and the pair often spent time in each other's houses over the following weeks. However, during this time, both Ristoro and Delilah developed strong friendships with Rue Malak, victor of the 90th Hunger Games, who allegedly took the pair several times to go hunting illegally in the forest beyond the district with her and her brother Crimson. Furthermore, Ristoro was one of the most vocal instigators of the riots that occurred throughout District 12 during District 9's games. After some deliberation, he narrowly avoided the death sentence, like the other instigators, due to his status as a district victor, but he was instead given a televised flogging as a warning to other potential radicals. Delilah, on the other hand, 
is one of the key suspects in the unsolved murder of Chief Peacekeeper Cardew, which occurred during these riots. Whilst it is generally agreed by most criminal historians of our land that Delilah herself did not directly poison Cardew, she is thought to be one of several people that played a part in his murder, although nobody has ever been charged with this crime. Following District 6's games, both Delilah and Restoro were allegedly furious about having to return to the capital, and Restoro even needed to be threatened at gunpoint to leave his house and family. Furthermore, due to the events that occurred after District 4's games, no further records have been found for any of the population of District 12.